Welcome to Connected Learning TV at Educator Innovator. Today is Friday, March 2nd, 2018. I'm Joe Dillon, and I'm your host for this conversation. I'm a teacher consultant with the Denver Writing Project, and I teach English at Rangeview High School in Aurora, Colorado. I'm joined by a large panel here to discuss this month's marginal syllabus reading, which is titled, The Stories They Tell, Mainstream Media, Pedagogies of Healing, and Critical Mass Media. It was published in January 2017 in the Journal of English Education. So, uh, so I want to begin by allowing our guests to introduce themselves. So if you all would, if April, would you mind going first? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank Hi, you. Uh, my name is April Baker Bell. I am a professor of English education at Michigan State University. Um, that's, that's an easy introduction that I go in and I think that's plenty. Okay. Raven? Yes. Hello, everyone. My name is Raven Jones Sangro. I'm a proud Detroit native and resident and an assistant professor of teacher education at Michigan State University. And Sakina? It's so fun and clunky that I'm calling on you all, but I think it's important to note that, that the authors of the piece are introducing themselves first, so I think that's great. So Sakina, you're, you're the remaining author. And you're muted, which is fine. Hi. <laughs> there you are. Hi. Um... <laughs> I'm Sakina Everett, and um, I'm the Director of Research and Outreach here at the University of Illinois, Chicago, of a Black Male Early Literacy Impact Project. Welcome. And Sharice, uh, you're one of our readers this, this month. Would you mind uh, introducing yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Sharice McBride. I'm a doctoral student at the University of California, Berkeley, studying uh, language, literacy, and culture. And I also teach in our um, teacher education programs there in our graduate school of education. And hi, everybody. I'm Nicole Mira. I'm an assistant professor of urban teacher education at Rutgers University uh, and a connected learning ambassador for the National Writing Project. Happy to be here. And my name is Ramey Collier. I'm an assistant professor of learning technologies at the University of Colorado in Denver and one of the co-organizers of the Marginal Syllabus Project. Terrific. So I sure appreciate you all introducing yourselves and uh, that's the easiest way to make sure we get the introductions right. Um, anywho, the Marginal Syllabus, Syllabus Project is a project that convenes and sustains equity conversations in the margins of texts online using di the digital annotation tool hypothesis. We'll provide more details about the project in a bit, but I wanna begin by asking the, our authors to uh, share background about this month's piece. Um, I'd love to hear anything you think readers might find interesting or anything you, you think is important to note about the context of the piece or or you know the, the maybe the work that went into writing the piece or the piece itself. Yeah, um, I'm just going to jump in and, and invite my co-authors to come right in. But I want to say that this uh, this piece um, it really started back in 2012 um, when Raven, Sakina, and I were graduate students in Django Pierce's class. And what was happening in the world at that time was Trayvon Martin. Um, What's, which I'm sure you all know who Trayvon Martin is. If not, you can look him up. But Trayvon Martin was um, killed at that time. And for Raven and I in particular, we were working on a group project for um, Django Paris's class. And we really felt the need to not move on with, um, the class was around social justice, but we really felt compelled to bring what was happening in the world into the classroom at that time and have a discussion around critical literacies and um, the kind of work we were talking about with youth um, into that space. And so a lot of the things that some of the practices we share is, is something that Raven and I, you know, started out with what creating for our graduate course and who, 
it was really, it consisted of teacher educators and thinking about how do we take up what's happening in the world specifically around racial violence um, and bring it into a space and how should teachers who are working with youth, particularly youth of color, you know, how can they take these issues up and work with the youth? And so it started there. And, um, but this particular article, it came out of a special issue that me and two of my other colleagues, Lamar Johnson and Tamara Butler did. And the title of it was um, uh, From Racial, Racial Violence to Racial Justice. Uh, and we were trying to think about what are the practices, you know, that we take up with issues around racial violence. So it's part of a larger special issue that we did um, with many great pieces um, included in that special issue that focuses on uh, racial violence in the world and what should we be doing as English educators and English teacher educators around this topic. So this is just one of many of the pieces, but I would say that's how it started from me. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add to um, what Dr. Baker Bell just said. Uh, it definitely began by us having conversations um, as a result of being in Dr. Paris's class. And particularly for April and I, um, we carpooled together every week to go to class. So we were always having these conversations in addition to Sakina because we all had the class together. So, you know, we understood that then, um, actually Trayvon Martin was murdered on February 26, which was this past week, six years ago. So we felt the need um, and just the rites of passage, just to understand that we can't all the time go on with business as usual as teachers. We have to sometimes stop and sort of um, give due and justice and time and space to invite others to share their feelings and emotions about the massacre of black and brown bodies, as well as other injustices that have been happening um, around um, black and brown bodies. So it definitely began there. And I'm just excited to see that it has catapulted into this, which leads us to where we are today. And so I'm just excited and proud of what we've been able to do um, to push our thinking and to know that, you know, we've grown definitely within six years. Yeah, I just want to add to uh, add a few words, um, you know, in, in the spirit of taking time to, you know, acknowledge uh, what was going on in the world um, and thinking about who we, who we are as English educators and also as teacher educators, um, we felt the need to also address our own healing in this process. And so, um, that, that was one of the um, kind of goals of the piece too, to think about like, how do we support one another as English educators and teacher educators? And then how do we also support other um, educators out there? And so um, to do that, you know, it, it naturally flowed that we um, got together on, I believe that was a Saturday um, afternoon, morning, all day situation in uh, a uh, Dr. Baker Bell's um, basement. And, you know, we began healing among ourselves, just kind of being honest about like how we felt about what was going on. And, um, you know, we were literally writing on the wall um, and, you know, just reflecting and trying to make sense of what was going on at the time. And um, how could we use our you know, skills and expertise in English education to um, do something meaningful. Um, and so we, we had to heal among ourselves. And I just wanted to, you know, so the piece was written um, from a place of love and justice and um, healing um, and, and commitment to support others. Yeah. If I can just add one thing to it, the other part, and maybe we're going to get to this, but one of the things that you all asked, you, you asked us about was the writing process. And the one thing that I want to um, highlight here is that we really relied on the voices, community voices around what's happening with racial violence. We really wanted this piece to be something very different that wasn't just like that we are having this conversation within academia. And to be honest with you, at that time, this conversation was not being taken up in academia in the ways that we were beginning to think about. So one of the things that we um, did was we, we cited a lot of um, community voices here. We relied on the spaces that um, people of color and allies and activists were going to to find out what was really happening in the world. So we know that when we were cutting on mainstream media, you know, how those narratives and stories were being told was 
was different than the way in which the communities would talk about it. And so for us, it, before we got to the article, when we were trying to find out what was happening, you know, in certain communities, we had to go to Twitter and follow certain hashtags, you know, to get to what's really happening in those communities from the community's perspective. And so in writing this piece, we really wanted it to represent um, how communities of color and allies are going to find out what's really happening. And so we wanted to make sure that we upheld those voices in this piece. And so even if you look at the citations, many of them are non-academic you know, citations. There were blogs that we looked at to help us understand, you know, the patterns of racial violence that's happening in the media that we went to and said, yeah, this is right, right? And these are the type of things we, we know have been happening for some time. And so that's what you will see reflected in this piece. And really quickly, before we move forward, uh, bringing it sort of back full circle, I just wanted to uh, mention that um, in addition to the communities of color citations, we also had conversations around what our elders and our ancestors thought of this work. And so that's where the Malcolm X and the Bell Hooks citations came from, because as, as Black women scholars, we, we understand and we understood fully that, you know, there were some things happening back then that are very well connected to what's going on now in the struggle with Black and Brown communities. And so we wanted to sort of have all voices of all generations represented in the work. Mm -hmm. I think that's fabulous background, really important. And I appreciate, I, I still want to continue to invite the authors to weigh in on those questions of how did this, where did this piece come from? What was the writing process like? What I think, you know, I'd love it if we continue to, you know, remember things about the writing of this piece or what was important that happened in the carpool conversations or the basement meetings. I think your ability to provide insight into that is really awesome. Um, so great. In, in a moment, we'll transition to a conversation with about the reading. But first, I want to ask um, Ramey to just talk a little bit about the Marginal Syllabus Project to give context to the conversation we're about to have. Thanks, Joe. And, and again, I am so, um, I've been furiously taking notes um, as we've been having this conversation. And I, again, I'm so appreciative of our partner authors, April, Raven, and Sakina. And, and as I introduced the Marginal Syllabus Project, I hope to actually draw upon some of what you said because it speaks so well to the spirit of this effort, which is, which is now in its second year. And so as Joe mentioned briefly, the Marginal Syllabus convenes and sustains conversations with educators about issues of equity in teaching and learning and education. And the project embraces a very intentional political and technical double entendre. And from a political perspective, we of course agree with what Raven said, we can't go along with business as usual. And we can't have educators and teacher educators simply kind of do schooling as usual. And so we want to engage with experts, writers, and authors whose, whose scholarship whose scholarly expertise and perspective can help us to not go along with business as usual. So that's a kind of marginal perspective that we wanna bring always into the center of our reading process. And of course, from a technical perspective, these conversations occur online and they use an open source technology called Hypothesis that allows us to have conversations in the margins of an online text, hence the marginal syllabus. And we now are in our second, again, year of programming, and we have worked with, at this point, nearly two dozen partner authors, um, all types of texts. And this year, the marginal syllabus is hosted by the National Writing Project and concerns a theme of writing our civic futures, which of course really resonates with much of what we've read in this month's piece. And of course, this of course it just resonates so well. Sakina, a few minutes ago, you mentioned the idea of of literally writing on the walls as the three of you came together to yeah. write this piece. And the marginal syllabus wants to create a similar type of experience amongst readers and authors in a digital space where those folks who are reading your work can begin to have that conversation literally on the wall of your writing <laughs> when it's in a digital space. Yeah. And so I just am so, um, again, appreciative of, again, the kind of relying on the kind of community voices, April, that you mentioned. Raven, you also talked about kind of voices across generations. These are the kinds of 
practices that we hold dear in this project, bringing it then into digital spaces. And so again, we're just so pleased and thankful to have all of you as our partner authors this month. I could ramble on forever. I'm gonna shut myself up, uh, but thank you again for working with us. Thanks, Ramey, for that background. Now I think it's, it's important, you know, now that we understand the context of the project and we understand that this is a pre-recorded webinar that will uh, be published as folks are reading the, the text online and having the opportunity, uh, readers will have the opportunity to engage with each, with each other in the margins of this text. And so I think it's, um, it's you know, timely to invite Sharice and Nicole to just raise any questions they had about the, about the piece, any reactions they had, any noticings. So kind of an open-ended conversation about what you took away from the piece or what you're wondering about. Yeah, if I could start, I will. I do want to acknowledge that I so appreciate having um, that conversation from the authors just now. That was amazing to hear um, really the background um, on how you all came to do this work. And it brings me to think about um, the AERA Div K chat that we just had this week where we were talking about activist scholarship this is activist scholarship in action. Um, one of the keys that you all, um, I think, uh, Sakina, you were just talking about was collectivities. Um, the, the need for collaboration and collection, collective action in this work that we're doing. This is it's just so beautiful. Um, so like Ramey, I was taking a lot of notes and um, this work around love, justice and healing within ourselves, within our communities, restoration um, within generations there's there's so much powerful work that's coming out of this so i just want to acknowledge that and say that i am so appreciative of um, being here and being able to talk about this so um that that it came through in the in the in my reading of it and it's even more powerful to be able to hear more background um, from you all um so I, I could start with one one noticing that really shine um, as I was reading was this notion of media literacy. Um, as we think about, I know particularly I did um, annotate in the hypothesis app, even though I used um, I kept my annotations to myself for now. I'll publish them a little later. Um, as you all talked about the. Um, <laughs> <laughs> <Don't laugh at me. laughs> I, th I think here. <laughs> no, we have uh, we have some comedians in the chat, so no one's laughing yeah. at you, Charisse. It's yeah, it's the playful banter <laughs> in the in the chat that folks can't see. <laughs> some margins within the marginal syllabus here. Yeah. Um, so here on one thirty three. I mean, I just want to go directly. It's it's a theme that's throughout, but. This, this whole notion of the images, the text that we see in mainstream media around um, black bodies and black people, this, but this particular line um, was one I wanted to draw attention to where you say images of black people in mainstream media are often used to maintain white supremacy. I thought <clears throat> that, that line really hit the nail on the head where as you um, draw this very pointed analysis of how um, it's so important for us as teachers, as teacher educators, to think about media literacy. And it, um, you kind of, it, it made me think about some of the work that um, Tessa Joles and the Center for Media Literacy folks um, have kind of distilled to these five questions of what, what's happening in any text that you look at. Um, and, you know, who created this message and the understanding that there is a, always a um, power and profit behind media messages, um, but you named it right here <clears throat> that images are, are often used to maintain white supremacy. And so as we think about uh, training our teacher educators, training our students to be able to trace those elements of profit and power within any images that go forward, this is, um, I, I thought it was so it was such a great example for, for us to be able to use in, in some of our programs to um, sort of think about what this has looked like. And um, you, had, you had such great examples throughout the whole piece um, of what this has looked like over the past 
you know, it, you could name it, but you had the examples from the next five years, uh, from the past five years. Yeah, uh, if I could speak to that a bit, um, it, where that came from, because there's a lot out about critical media literacy. And I think what we were thinking about was critical media literacy in these specific times. And it was kind of difficult to find things that specifically spoke about that, right? Specifically from an academic standpoint. So um, we relied on Bell Hooks's work, right? In Black Looks, there's an introduction chapter and she talks really about the history of, you know, how the representation of Black bodies in media or in general, like if you open up magazines, you know, and you look at these type of representations as used to maintain white supremacy. And so in thinking about how this piece came together, we had to bring together Bell Hooks's perspective with what's out there, like Ernest Morell's work around critical media literacy to kind of put forth this analysis. But it also helped that we were able to find, um, I think it's Maisha Johnson's work, where she just really laid it out in her uh, Everyday Feminism blog about what this looks like. And I really felt that her piece really represented that community perspective because although Bell Hooks is talking about it, um, I think about the type of media literacies that my parents have, right, or my grandmother had. And, you know, these were the perspectives that are always known through the community, right, that as Black people, we're not represented right, or as Brown people, we're not represented right. And also um, not relying on the news. You rely on the news only so much, right, and, and particularly in a Black community. Um, but there's a different perspective or kind of a counter story to what's represented in the news media. And I feel thinking from those pers perspectives, Bell Hook said one thing, Ernest Morell is saying another thing, you had Maisha Johnson, and then we had our own um, literacies, you know, our own media literacies that comes from our families and the communities that we represent that helped us really to offer this analysis for teachers and students, which we think that students also come with these kind of literacies already. I think in classrooms, it's about providing them the space to have that conversation. Right, right. Absolutely, and if, if I could just add, um, Sharice, I appreciate you for pointing out that there's always a profit and power behind messages. That's absolutely right. And so for the three of us, we've always been very, very intentional about the merging of our professional and our personal lives. Yeah. So just heard Dr. Baker Bell speak to um, her, the family literacies that she's been able to enact since she was a young person. And that's not by happenstance. We understand that we have to draw on what our parents and what our parents' parents taught them so that we aren't um, repeating these sort of um, just discriminatory acts as we rear and bring up other young people and students and even our own children. So this is very personal. It's very personal as well as professional. Yeah, the internalization, Raven, of those images because we know that we can internalize these representations you know, that are put out there about our bodies in terms of who we are. And so definitely, Correct. you know, using those literacies to prevent that from happening. Right, exactly. Right. And, um, you know, just kind of drawing from the, um, you know, merging, intentionally merging the professional and the personal, because we were all um, high school English teachers, it was, you know, like we, it was very difficult to not do that, right? And so, you know, I just want to underscore or how we were like, well, we have to pull from this expertise that we have. Like, we all know how to read and write quite well. And, um, you know, we're used to helping students to be able to see beyond the text, to read between the lines. And so, um, you know, we had to, you know, do that for ourselves and to think about, like, how can we, you know, use this expertise to help other uh, teachers, too? And we wanted to acknowledge that young people already come to the classroom with these, you know, very sophisticated conversations and analyses around what's going on. Um, one of the young men that we um, highlighted was the young man from Baltimore who, you know, was just let's just say livid about like what was going on. And, you know, there's so many references, I mean, like, unfortunately, in, in this piece, and even since we've written this piece of um, black and brown children who have, you know, been violated in so many ways, um, you know, even in school spaces being, you know, drug around in um, your classroom space, the young lady, like, so, you know, the folks are, young people are having these conversations in the hallway, in the lunchroom, as they walk to school, 
And like, we were those young people, you know what I mean? Uh, Dr. Baker, Baker Bell and um, Joan Sarah, like they're from Detroit, I'm from Brooklyn. And so, you know, we are used to having these, you know, very <laughs> analytical conversations with our peers. And um, we wanted to acknowledge that like young people are doing this and um, not only are they doing it with one another, they're doing it on social media. And so we follow some of the young people to figure out like, well, what are they saying? How are they making sense of this? Um, when we were teenagers, we didn't have social media. We didn't have black Twitter and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, we wanted to, you know, acknowledge what they're bringing in because the other thing too that often happens in English ed classrooms is that, you know, black and brown students, they're, brilliance isn't acknowledged um and so we wanted to um you know in this academic space if you will uh create a platform and an opportunity to reimagine the ways that we see uh black and brown children um and and to um equip them with um you know a way to be seen as a uh, critical media uh people um, in, in classroom spaces. I just wanted to, to jump in. I also wanted to, first of all, uh, give my appreciation and love for being here, uh, this morning with all of you. I'm, I'm part of all of your academic fan clubs, uh, <laughs> and I'm excited to be able to talk to you about this article. Uh, I also, as picking up on the conversation, I think this is a perfect example of what it means when we talk about public scholarship. Uh, public scholarship doesn't just mean putting our work out uh, as it's written academically with the academic jargon into the public. It's about transforming what scholarship itself can include, that the voices of elders, the voices of our communities should be considered uh, relevant and rigorous data for scholarship, not just stuff we find from um, other texts. So I appreciate the kind of real public scholarship that's happening here. Um, so thank you for that. There are two questions that I, I, I've been thinking about, and we can take up whichever one the group feels they want to, my first question was kind of about, um, I found myself thinking about that phrase of mainstream media a lot that kind of starts from the very beginning of the piece. And I said to myself, what do I, what do we assume right now mainstream media is? I mean, I think a lot about, you know, kind of traditional forms. A lot of the examples that you mentioned of times that white supremacy has been invoked has been on cable news networks, uh, TV news, newspapers, those kinds of things. Uh, but I also think about, I think I would have thought at this point, yeah, I, I almost think that places like Facebook and Twitter, I would kind of consider them mainstream media at this point in some ways. Mm. But then there's black Twitter. And so I think there's ways that people from minoritized communities are taking up spaces and and uh, hacking them and reworking them to their own purposes to find solidarity. I think there's something really exciting about that. But also the fact that Twitter can be doing the exact things and supporting white supremacy at the same time that it's opening up these spaces for uh like alternative conversations. So I'm really curious about kind of how you're thinking about media and are we at a point where we need to even move outside of these corporate controlled social media spaces? I know there's young people now creating their own apps, creating their own um, forms of media to kind of get past this idea of having to communicate on these tools that often support white supremacy. So I think that's a whole conversation that I'm really interested in. And then the other conversation as well is at the end of your article, which is really powerful on page 148, where you talk about uh, what teachers, the work that teachers need to do and the political stance we need to start thinking of, which I think could be a whole other article. Uh, you, you say, in teaching toward racial justice, educators must also become comfortable with being uncomfortable and vulnerable when engaging in conversations about racial injustice. Even the most well-intentioned educators avoid this topic in their classrooms for fear of misspeaking, sounding racist, not having answers, or causing more harm than help. And I thought that was really important, and I thought that uh, if we don't think about the political stance that we need to have as educators, there's an assumption here of who you need to be to be an educator willing to engage with these issues because education itself can support and propagate white supremacy. It already does. Well, we'll talk about this, right? right? Like, I'm doing this every day. Um, and so what it means to, to help, and now that I'm in a, a situation of training pre-service teachers, what does it mean to get people into the classroom that I feel comfortable being in front of students who are going to be willing to, to make Really to, to take this leap and be uncomfortable and examine their own power and privilege. I think both of these are really uh, things that I keep thinking about after I've read. So I'm curious, you know, where you want to take that conversation. Yeah, um, 
I think about the, the last question that you just put out because it comes up a lot and I presented um, at LRA um, just this past December on, on this particular piece. And one of the questions that came up for me was, um, you know, what, sh how should we prepare, you know, teachers to, particularly because if it's, we think about the teaching force is predominantly white, you know, middle class teachers going into the classroom, how can we prepare them to take this up? And I think um, here is where I think about something that Bettina Love talks about in terms of, you know, allies, you know, and people say that they're allies, but we, we rely on the work of, like we wrote this piece, you know, as a woman of black women wrote this piece because it speaks from our experience. But in terms of how pre-service teachers should take, take this up or how English educators who consider themselves allies should take it up, it's we need that help in terms of thinking about what, what that should look like, right? And I think about what uh, Bettina Love says, it's we don't need just allies, we need co-conspirators. And I think about what that co-conspirator uh, might mean and it means that like we need to be n not only us thinking about this conversation but how can we think about this together in terms of how we prepare um, pre-service teachers because we put out you know um, this piece which was very personal um, both Raven and I are mothers and so um, I was thinking about the year after we presented this work in Django's class I had my son and I was we were at his dedication um, I think the day after George Zimmerman was not found guilty for that murder. And so, you know, it's very personal. So it took a lot for us to um, write this piece and to share these kind of very personal stories. And like Sakina pointed out that we were trying to heal through it. And so we did that. But at this point, I think we want to think together, you know, with um, folks who are preparing, you know, white pre-service teachers, particularly who are white themselves in terms of what, what's the next step? How do, you know, we prepare around this kind of work? Um, so that was my first thinking um, there. I don't know if any of you have want to add to that before. Yeah, um, you know, I think part of the work is acknowledging that it happens. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we said that like, you know, some folks, they, they don't want to talk about race or they don't want to engage, um, particularly in the Michigan context um, where this piece was, you know, written up. Um, a lot of the pre-service teachers that I worked with um, in and around Michigan State, for example, um, felt like they were being racist if they mentioned the word race. And so um, that, that's a, um, a situation that, you know, we now, because we're Black women, we're, we're very open and often talking about race. And so we had to kind of break down that barrier and say like, look, just because you mentioned the word race in class does not make you a race, an actively racist person trying to, you know, shape, you know, a particular space. And so, you know, part of, you know, what, what, what we wanted to do was to create an opportunity for folks to start having conversations. You have to literally become comfortable with having a conversation. Like if a black boy, like in this case with Trayvon Martin or, you know, Mike Brown or whoever had just been gunned down in the street, murdered, um, and you know you have a bunch of black boys and girls in your classroom, please believe they have had the conversation on the way to school and they're talking about it. What, if anything, are you going to do in your English classroom to support them in and around what's going on. And, like, and to yeah. add to that, Sakina, I want to also say though, I, and also th that's very important, that, that perspective, particularly when you have youth in the classroom who look like Trayvon, right? Or it can be um, you know, racialized in the same ways, but it's also important that these conversations happen in classrooms where there are not people of color, there are predominantly white student population, because I think that what we have to understand, and this is what I try to, you know, speak to my pre-service teachers about our graduate students is that this conversation is not one-sided. When we talk about race, it's not just for people of color. It's for all of us, right? We're all, we all have something to do with racial justice and racial violence and how white supremacy happens. And so that work is not just of people of color because I find out that that's what happens is that, oh, well, I don't, and, and I think it comes out of a space of people who don't know their role in that conversation, right? There are particular ways in which you can enter that conversation and there are other ways in which you should not enter in that conversation, right? Like you, you first of all, you can't enter into the conversation and um, not acknowledge people's experiences, 
one of the things that I try to point to, even with my colleagues who are white, is their determination on what's racist and what is not. And I think that that's, that's not a way to enter, right? To tell someone that I don't think that that's a racist experience because if you are a person who've experienced racism, then unless you're a person that experienced racism, you can't say, you know, what that is. And so um, I think that there needs to be a conversation, not just about race, but about what, are, what is our role in this conversation about race? I constantly have to ask myself as a black woman that what's your role in this conversation, you know, and what, what do you do in here? I, I don't see that I'm supposed to, that this work is, is something that I'm supposed to do alone or that um, if I don't, like I talk about in this special issue, after Mike Brown, when that first happened, it was my first year on the tenure track. And I had a group of, you know, white, uh, you know, pre-service teachers. And, they, and I, generally at Michigan State, I get students who are wanting to be actively involved. But this semester, I decided I was not going to have a conversation with these students because I was in so much pain and watching what was happening. It was Mike Brown and then it was uh, Tamir Rice and, you know, so many things even happening locally in Michigan. And I said, I can't right now deal with helping um, these students work through, um, you know, their own participation and to see how they participate in white supremacy and all of these things. I decided that's not for me because what's more important right now is for you to heal. And that was the stance I took up. So I think that this is a question for us all, all to ask, like, what is my role in it? We all have a role in it, but what is that? And how do we enter this conversation? Absolutely. And so, so many things are going through my mind right now as I dissect and try to synthesize what everybody just said. But I think that um, the ways in which the three of us tried to take up these notions and these tenets was by creating the lesson plans that we offered in the back of the article. And for me, that was sort of my first time um, pushing, you know, or working collaboratively collaboratively to push our thinking so that we aren't just putting out a piece that is sort of saying some things but not specifically saying some things. Or here is some ways that you can take this up in your classroom on Monday morning. You know what I'm saying? So I think in addition to the conversations, in addition to the allyship, we have to understand that we need some practical knowledge to pass on to our colleagues, to our racist friends and mothers and all kind of folks who come to Thanksgiving dinner. You know what I mean? Like we aren't the group of women, black women you want to be around and you say things like, <laughs> oh, I, I can't be racist because I have black friends. No, honey, we are going to challenge that and encourage you to, to check yourself because we have to present ourselves and be fully present all the time when we're standing not only in front of our children but in front of our students so if we aren't taking up the positions and understandings that you know it's not about us it's about the future it's about future generations then we should not be teaching and that's that's just real talk and i think we all understand that fully and so that goes back to the merging of the personal and the professional and um to get at the first question you asked um dr mira about um, the spaces and the Twitter in terms of white supremacy, one of the lesson plans that we offered up was just questioning those spaces. What can you do to protest and to dismantle these spaces that, you know, put forth that, that racist propaganda? So, you know, there are some specific ways that we can continue to do that, but acknowledging it, as we all mentioned before, is a, is a good start. And then once we acknowledge it, how can we specifically draw that out? Yeah, I thought that was so powerful, both the lesson plans and the um, the idea of, of not only making a claim that teachers need to care about this, but that this is the core of what disciplinary literacy instruction is about, that this is our job as English teachers, all of us, not putting the burden on communities of color to have to explain this to everyone else, or right. that this is some kind of separate agenda from what literacy is. If we hmm. think the literacy is reading the word in the world, this is our core job as English teachers is to be doing the very things that you're outlining in these lesson plans is about looking not only at traditional canonical texts uh, outside of, you know, a vacuum of time and space, but actually engaging with uh, the forms of literacy that people are using right now and the political and social ends that they're being used for. So I really appreciated uh, putting those lesson plans in there and reminding us that this is the work of literacy. If you are an English teacher, this is your work. This is, this is what we are, this is what we've signed up to do. Uh, and that we don't, we don't get the we don't get the choice, or it shouldn't be a choice. It's a it's a yeah. abnegation of our personal and professional responsibilities 
if we say that being an English teacher means that I don't need to engage with this, that's the core of what we should be doing. I think it's really right. powerful. Because, I mean, you can take what we put forth here and you could look at the text that you're, uh, you know, presenting in your classrooms and it's still upholding, you know, the same type of, you know, white supremacist agenda that we talk about in this piece. But I wanted to get to your, about what you said about, you know, looking at Facebook and looking at Twitter in terms of how, um, you know, this can become, you know, like, is this mainstream media? Like, what is mainstream media? I think that that's a good conversation. I, I was automatically thinking about a, an activity to do with students around this, right? But then I think it's also important for us to um, think about the power that stands behind, like, when we're talking about, you know, Facebook as uh, mainstream media or Twitter or something like that. Like, you have Black Twitter there, and it exists, and it's powerful, right? And it has made many changes happen. But in terms of like how there are spaces within the social media um, um, where, there, where there are spaces that continue to perpetuate white supremacy, um, I think looking at how power, you know, is represented in that, like what type of power is, uh, stands behind, you know, those kind of messages and who it is. It's so, it seems like an important project that can happen and to begin to get used to thinking these ways, because certainly it's not just like the CNN and MSNBC and Fox News, right? It's not just the billboards and all of these things. It's becoming where social media is. Like I know one thing that I did, something happened locally here at one of the schools after Trump was elected. And um, there, you know, some of the students, it was something that happened. And I went to the comments that were being left on this news page. And one of um, the people were saying that was great. Someone said that was great that the students um, did this. And what the students did, what, I think they, they were antagonizing the students of color in the school. And I followed that person's um, Facebook page to see, you know, the type of things that they were looking into. And oh my God, you know, the type of news, to news stories that they were following and things like that, which perpetuated white supremacy was really interesting to me. Mm. And that's the exact opposite types of images and news that you would see on maybe my uh, Facebook and Twitter and also some of the youth that we were following and some of the other folks that I follow. So I think those type of analyses are also important um, in thinking about this, but yeah. So I, I just really want to jump in. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> Who, I think I just cut you off, Sharice. Go ahead. Just briefly, I, I really appreciate how you do bring up the importance of student composition in that process and their ability to create their own um, messages, you know, whether that be on on social media and then the multiple ways that they can engage in their own activism, whether they're using the platforms or they're going out in, you know, in community and engaging. Um, I, I felt like there, again, um, there was a lot of ways for us to consider how we might even think about that notion of co-conspirators more broadly, um, because uh, thinking about students' power for, you know, their agency, not only in their writing and what they're going to be doing, but how that power is enacted when they go out and actually try to take up these practices of, of activism, right? They're going to need allies in adults, in partnerships and things like that to actually make change. So um, that, that was, I, I thought that was really powerful to imagine, for us to begin to imagine. And I think the next level of analysis I've been thinking about now, like, so there's the mainstream media uh, that are putting out these, this ideology. Now we've got young people speaking back to it, but we're getting to a place where even that requires deep political analysis. Like we're thinking about why the young people in, in Parkland who are raising their voices which is great and amazing in the wake of what's gone gone down there. But why is it that you know young people that have been part of the Black Lives That's Matter movement right. Right, have been also speaking back to media portrayals for years, and, and that doesn't get the violence. same national kind of yeah the same national kind of like getting behind them. And I think there's issues there that to be discussed. And I think people start to get a little um, you know like sour grapes like oh why do you even have to bring that up? Why can't we just be happy that young people are speaking back? Which is important, but again we can't. Again, if we if we make it a part of our discipline that our job is to critically analyze, That's right. you know, every single time, like no matter who's speaking, we're looking at the the forces, the social forces of uh, hegemony that are acting upon, like who even gets listened to and why, what youth get to speak and what youth don't get to speak back, and what do we find acceptable as a society? I think having these skills of critical media literacy, looking at the media and then the responses to it, 
I think is, is it, it's a conversation that, that then builds on itself and the students get these skills of analysis of looking at every, every utterance. I'm always looking at trying to look for all perspectives and look at the, the messages behind the message and whose power and privilege is being used at any given point. I think that's important. We should want our students to have that, 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 that sense of that, um, that skill. Yeah, I mean, that's a skill that, that they need for the, the right now, right? It's not anything that we want to wait for this Parkland, you know, whatever happens there and to come back around and say, remember when this thing was going on? It's so important for students to have these skills and actively use them as the world is happening right now. And so, and also getting across that it's not, it's not to take away from anything from Parkland. We can both, you know, recognize that those students involved in, in this Parkland, um, you know, um, unfortunate situation but the activist work that they are doing is very important and acknowledge that but at the same time offer a an analysis of what's happening and whose voices you know can um who which which type of people can be activists right who can be activists and how is that okay i think that that is imp it's, it's so important for us to talk about these things um right now because there are so many voices that have been left left behind and have you know argued about the same thing and the shootings like in Chicago, if we think about, for example, there are so many activists on the ground having these conversations, but are ignored um, by, if we want to think about mainstream media. So I, first of all, I'd like to echo the idea that it's so important to talk about these things right now. And, you know, I think it's so important. I keep looking at the time and thinking we probably have somewhere between five and 10 minutes remaining and wishing we had 25 minutes remaining. So, and I'm just appreciative that, you know, I'm appreciative that the voices that need to come through in this conversation are coming through. I think that's really important. So I just appreciate you all chiming in. And I also want you to feel free to tell me we need an extra five minutes or whatever. But this is the time where I have to say, we got about five to 10-ish minutes remaining just to honor all your time. Um, I want to echo a couple things. Actually, Ramey, I want to kick it over to you. What have you got to say? Uh, n not much that, that that is coherent given the brilliance of the past 40, 40 odd minutes. Um, I've, I've continued to take some notes and my hope is that the educators and others who join the next phases of this conversation, that which occurs in an online space um, in the, through the digital annotation that we'll be doing together, continues to wrestle with what I consider to be some of these really core tensions and opportunities that have been brought to the surface. And I'm just gonna kind of reflect back again. I'm just now onto my third page of notes here. Um, you know, tensions around complicity and resistance and both individual educators and the communities of educators, particularly again, as a white man and thinking about the white folks that I do work with, our complicity in maintaining systems of, of oppression and hegemony and our resistance in various ways to that. Um, tensions that were raised around notions of, of voice and youth expertise and the ways in which that is both acknowledged and also again contested. I think this most recent uh, critical analysis around who gets to be activists and whose concerns around gun violence gets to be honored in various spaces. Uh, tensions around media platforms and the ways in which these very commercial, very white platforms like Facebook and Twitter uh, profit off of spaces like Black Twitter even when those are spaces of resistance. And so thinking about these kinds of tensions, and again, I'm, I'm gonna really not ramble because I am so moved by what's been generated in this conversation. And my hope is that readers of this article who appreciate both the emphasis on critical media literacy, who appreciate the very uh, generous sharing of the personal and professional that all of our partner authors have brought onto the page and then brought into this conversation, and then the very practical lessons, uh, one of which, and I just want to say very briefly, is a lesson involving annotation. The very first lesson when the students are writing and they pass their writing and I'm like, they're annotating, I love it. Uh, which is all to say that there's so much to engage with here. And my hope is that over the next number of weeks, uh, we continue to dig into these rich conversations. And I am just so again, thankful uh, again to April, to Raven, to Sakina for, for all of your contributions to this conversation. And again, thank you all so much. And of course, Sharice and Nicole, our lovely readers and regular collaborators. It is just wonderful to have everyone in this conversation. I can't hear. I really appreciate how you were able to, well, it's really unimportant that you tied annotation back to this, but I do think it, you know, 
it's, you know, it's novel that you did. And it also is inherent in the lesson. So I guess my two pieces before I want to give everyone else the last word is uh, a couple things. One, one thing I think that sticks out to me about this conversation is my continued frustration with the way the word racism is skewed by, you know, audiences who do not want to, you know, give marginalized populations voice, right? The idea that we shouldn't talk about race because that itself is racism. I am so frustrated with that, the way we're skewing such an important concept. And I think I personally, as I'm listening, o'clock. as, as I'm, Sorry, that's, <laughs> oh, that's okay. That's okay. As I'm listening to that conversation and frustrated, I guess I, I keep thinking, you know, well, what's the role of an anti-racist? Because as I think about this project being aspirational, I just want to keep asking myself, what's the role of an anti-racist? Because I want someone else to have to skew, some, skew the definition of another word while I'm trying to figure out what, is an, what should an anti-racist do now. And the other thing that I think is aspirational about this project is I think so many things I think about this piece, but I just love the lessons and I love you putting the lessons forward as things that might be iterated. And I think the opportunity that white teachers who, you know, serve communities of color will inevitably wrestle with these lessons, you know, in so many ways. And I just think there's something aspirational about the technology we're, we're leveraging here where when they ask tough questions about how do I, should I, what happens if, um, I just think there's a lot of potential for you all and folks in your community, you know, to help people along. And that this, the, the digital footprint we might leave behind, you know, could be a really powerful open educational tool for creating change for teachers just entering into the field. So that's long winded, but I wanna allow you all to whip around with the last thoughts. Yeah, well, um, thank you all so much for having us. I mean, it was, this is amazing. Um, and this is, this is real work, um, you know, happening. And it's making me think about one of the other things that we didn't mention, um, where this piece was very central to in this kind of work, we did a racial violence teaching at Michigan State mm -hmm. in 2015. Um, and it was a teaching because we are all thinking about practice all the time. Sakina, Raven, um, and many of our colleagues at Michigan State for you know, because we were classroom teachers before and classroom teachers are busy, right? And they are reading and, and always very thoughtful about, well, okay, how can I take this work up? And um, so for us, it was important to try to put something out that was practical, that you can change and do what you need to do uh, with it. But the teaching was that way. And what I like about this space here is because it, it gives us an opportunity to connect with people we, we typically wouldn't be able to just because of our where we are, right? Like we're in Michigan and doing this kind of work. So this provides a space for the work to continue to go on. And I think when with writing this piece, that's what we hope for. And that was one of the primary reasons for publishing it with English Ed. We hope that it gets in the hands of the people who need it the most. Um, and then just, uh, you just pointed out something with anti-racist work. I think that that's an important question to continue to come around to, to think about. Um, I'm current te teaching an anti-racist writing uh, methodology course. And a lot of what we're doing in the course, it's about writing, but it's about developing racial literacies, right? And thinking about, you know, how do we, how can we have this conversation? How can we begin to do the self-work that we need to do on ourselves in order to move this work forward? And so that's something that's very important. But I would also say um, to, um, especially teachers and English educators who are, you know, listening, mm -hmm. find your people, you know, find your people that's wanting to do the work. I mean, I think at the end of it all, no matter how uncomfortable we are, it's about doing the work, you know, toward racial justice specifically for our students and the communities that they represent. And if we can just stay in that space, no matter how uncomfortable, no matter if you mess up, no matter if the lesson does not go well, that we come back around to it and you find your people that's going to cultivate that and understand that this is a process, right? This is a world that we're living in right now it's not the world that i recall you know it's it's the same world but with with media and things like that i did not experience the world that the way that you my children are experiencing right now because they have access to so many things and so i just think we need to build together grow together and find our people that's going to help us do it yeah, yeah. wow and i just want to uh, jump in real quick because i have to log off and actually go teach my pre-service english teachers or we're gonna we're gonna keep working on this we're gonna keep building on this work but i want to thank everyone <laughs> Uh, for letting me be part of this conversation. I feel like um, this idea, I really love this idea of, of getting to a place where we teach pre-service teachers and 
in-service teachers that when we say that we are teachers of literacy, we can think of all the different parentheticals that go in front of that. Literacy is not just one thing. It's racial literacy, class literacy, gender literacy, academic literacies of reading, writing, listening, and speaking. But all of those unspoken, we, I think we need to make them all explicit that when you are a teacher of literacy, there's a million different things that, that go in front of that of what we mean. And I think that just helps us to understand that our role is so much more than than looking at words in a vacuum. We're looking at words in this particular social moment. So thank you, everyone. And uh, I want to keep building with you soon. I'll see you all soon. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you Dr. <laughs> and I'll go next. I'm just I'm so very overjoyed with this entire process and everything that has been put forth. And I just want to encourage us all, um, like we've all said before, is to continue to have conversations no matter where we are, the subway, Target. I'm at Target a lot because I'm always buying something for my two-year-old. Uh, but, you know, we just, we have ample opportunities to amplify and affirm the voices and experiences of Black and brown bodies. And so if we're not doing that, again, we need to ask ourselves, why are we here? Why are we in existence? Um, I often think about, again, going back to my two-year-old, her name is Zuri Hudson, and each and every day before we leave the house, she's always asking me and her father, what's next? What's next? What are we gonna do next? And so sometimes I think we need to go back to those young people, even, even younger than the, the, the voices and experiences of the folks that we're teaching in our classrooms. We got elementary and pre-elementary um, early childhood students who are able and wanting to know more about the world around them, about injustices. So we have to figure that out to make sure that we are understanding that we have a larger audience to address. Um, and then lastly, uh, I, I'm noticing that the work that I'm doing and the teaching that I'm doing at MSU and with family literacy is involving more parental voice. Sometimes I think that that's a little bit absent in terms of academia work. Um, we need to be more intentional about how we can empower and encourage parents to continue to have these conversations with their children and their students at home so that the children feel better equipped to go into the classrooms. You know, parents are a children's first teacher, and we have to get back at that notion sometimes in order to um, build up and empower all types of communities. But thank you again. Yeah. Thank you for this opportunity to um, be able to, you know, kind of reflect on and, and um, our experiences and our writing and um, all that went into it. And, um, you know, I just have warm, fuzzy feelings just thinking about, you know, where we were six years ago and, um, you know, the things that were on our minds as educators, doc students, and, you know, fast forward six years and where we are now and, and just how much has been accomplished and um, how much more needs to be done. Um, and so, you know, for me, I, I think, um, you know, leaving this sort of a practical toolkit, if you will, um, is, is an opportunity for teachers from all uh, walks of life, um, white, black, brown, et cetera, to be able to, um, I hope, my hope is that, you know, in reading the piece, it it's functions more like a heuristic or like, um, you know, it's not something, you know, kind of edged in stone. It's, um, you know, I hope that people will read it and be inspired and say like, oh, okay, that's what they did. That makes sense in their particular context. My context functions in this particular way, but here are the things that I can take from what they did, um, given the students that I'm working with, given who I am. And, you know, all the while recognizing that teaching is a political act. Um, your very presence in the classroom space is political and you make daily decisions as an educator about like, okay, so am I going to address what just happened on the news or I'm not going to address that? Am I going to do business as usual? Are we going to do this To Kill a Mockingbird reading today? Or are we going to, you know, like all of it, um, you make uh, decisions and thousands of them every day. Um, and, you know, I hope that this piece uh, forces English educators to think about the trajectory um, 
of you know their students and um and and their work as a as an educator and like what are we really equipping students to to know and be able to do um in what ways are we validating and affirming what they um <laughs> bring <laughs> bring to the classroom and um because you can you know look at standards and you know various requirements and you can teach them all the skills but you have to select the text um whether you're talking about annotation metaphor critical media liter media literacy etc like you choose the text um and so you know i'm thinking about you know what how teachers might see this as an opportunity for uh, a generative space, a creative space to, um, you know, be able to work with their academic content and requirements, but also acknowledge the humanity of the, the themselves and also the people who are in the classroom with them on a daily basis. I'll just end with saying that that what's next and um, what we've been saying really reminds me of the importance of creativity and imagination. We are naturally uh, creative and we imagine earlier, um, you, Raven, you were saying, thinking about children and where their imaginations go, where, where are we going, you know, yeah. and I think that um, as teachers, we have a responsibility as, as educators, we have responsibility to cultivate our um, students' imaginations. I think um, we all have, we've been seeing the appeal and the necessity of imagination with um, our, this cultural moment we're experiencing with Wakanda and um, Black Panther as folks have just rallied and said let's <laughs> let's imagine you know what the what what could be and so i mm -hmm. think the digital uh, space affords a kind of that kind of space for creativity and imagination for students to create their own um texts and their own um you know um kinds of creations that will live on and and express what you know what it is that's inside their creative brains and in their hearts and i think that um our our task ultimately is to is to imagine just social futures for our students and to help them to um, share with us what what that you know what they have in mind for that and um to really hear from them what 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 it is that um, needs to happen going forward so that cr we just need to hold, hold on to the creativity and the imagination that we're naturally born with i want to say amen yeah. <laughs> all right <laughs> we'll kind of forever we'll kind of <laughs> yes <laughs> What a great note to end on and just Ramey and I can't thank you enough for participating. And so thanks again to all of you. And thanks for this great conversation. We look forward to uh, meeting you in the March. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>